Cell membranes are composed of two phospholipid layers, and for this reason, they're often referred to as the phospholipid bilayer. The cell membrane, or the plasma membrane, is what forms a boundary between the cell and the extracellular environment, or the environment outside the cell. Because the cell membrane controls the passage of materials into and out of the cell, it's often referred to the, um, as the organelle that actually maintains homeostasis in the cell. So before we go any further, let's review the phospholipid structure. The phospholipid has the phosphate head up at the top, which is composed of a phosphate group and glycerol. Remember that the phosphate head is polar, therefore it likes water, it will um, dissolve in water. And then um, we can also describe that as being hydrophilic, which means to be attracted to water. And then the two fatty acid chains that are coming off of the phosphate head, those are nonpolar, and we can describe those as hydrophobic. So the cell membrane is composed of mostly those um, phospholipids. And those phospholipids, if you remember from our lipid um, unit, they do not actually form polymers. So each of those phospholipids that you're seeing in the picture here are independent of each other, which means that they can move around. And for this reason, the cell membrane is flexible and not rigid. So that means that each of these little phospholipids can actually move within the um, crowd of the others. Scientists use the term fluid mosaic model to describe the cell membrane, and that's because if you're looking down at the cell membrane from above, what you're going to see is all those little phosphate heads, and then dotted in those phosphate heads, you're going to see these proteins that are stuck in there. And each of these kind of potato-looking things, including this guy right here, those are all proteins that are stuck in the cell membrane. So now we're going to look at a bunch of um, membrane proteins or proteins that are stuck in the membrane. And the first one that we're going to look at, um, they're called transport proteins. And these allow molecules and ions to pass through the cell membrane. So some stuff like oxygen, um, which is O2 when it's in a molecule, some of that stuff can just go straight through the cell membrane. But some of the bigger molecules or if it's an ion with a charge, those are going to require a channel to run through. And that's what this thing is right here. This is called a protein channel and it's got that pore in the middle that lets um, molecules and ions pass through the cell membrane. Here we have another type of transport protein called a carrier protein, and this one undergoes a shape change in order to move material from one side of the cell to the other. Remember from our biomolecules unit that anytime we mentioned a protein, we always talked about how it had a specific shape, and you can see here that the protein, which is the purple, has that specific shape to fit whatever this particle is into that little pocket right there. As soon as that particle gets loaded up in that pocket, the protein is going to change its shape, and then that particle is going to be able to to leave on the other side. So our next category of proteins are called receptor proteins, and these receive chemical signals and perform some kind of action in response. So these chemical signals are small molecules referred to as ligands, and you can see down here that this ligand is going to bind with this receptor, and it's going to cause some kind of signal to happen in the cell, and the cell will perform some kind of action in response. And so a good example of this one um, is when we have hormones such as insulin, meet up with receptors in our cells. And what insulin does is it lowers our blood sugar and it does this by signaling the cells to bring sugar from the blood into the cells. And so that would be an example of a function that might happen as a result of one of these ligands. In this case, the ligand being the hormone insulin. So receptors can be found in two places. The first is simply called a membrane receptor. So that means that the protein is stuck in the cell membrane like what we see right here. And the ligand binds to the receptor, sends off a signal inside the cell, and we get some kind of action happening. This um, protein right here is the only one we're going to look at that's not a membrane protein. And you can see that when we look at the cell membrane right here, there actually are no proteins in this diagram. So the protein is actually inside the cell, and so we call it an intracellular receptor. And so what this means is that the ligand must first diffuse across the cell membrane, and then it can bind with that um, receptor protein, and then we'll have that signal occur. And so this is actually how a lot of hormones work, is that they diffuse through our cell membranes and bind with receptor proteins on the inside of the cell and cause a response to happen.
Our last membrane protein that we're going to look at is called a marker protein. And what this marker protein does is serves to identify cells to other cells. So this becomes especially important when we're talking about our immune system. And so our immune cells are going to be constantly looking at other cells in our bodies to make sure that those cells actually belong to us. If they encounter a cell that doesn't belong to us, like a bacteria that can harm us, then that immune cell is going to want to kill that cell. So you can think of marker proteins as being like an ID so that it, um, our cells know which ones are ours versus others. Um, and the way that this actually works is using this little carbohydrate chain. And you can see that there's actually one, two, three marker proteins here, each with that carbohydrate chain attached to it. And that carbohydrate chain is going to be unique to each individual. So you can kind of think of it like a fingerprint. And so that's going to be able to identify the cell as either being your own self or something else. So whenever we attach a carbohydrate to anything, we can use that um, prefix glyco in the front of this. And so a marker protein can also be called a glycoprotein, meaning a protein with a carbohydrate stuck to it. And the last thing we're going to look at is not actually a protein, but it is a lipid, which is cholesterol. Cholesterol is embedded in the nonpolar tails of the phospholipid bilayer. And you can see all these little green things right here. Those are all those steroid um, cholesterol molecules. And since steroids um, are lipids, like cholesterol is a lipid, then that's why they're wanting to interact with the nonpolar fatty acid tails of the phospholipid. So the cholesterol has three main functions when it comes to cell membranes. The first is that they keep those nonpolar tails from getting stuck to each other. So it actually helps to maintain the fluidity and the flexibility of the cell membrane. The second is that it's going to help to strengthen the cell membrane. And then the third is not immediately obvious in this picture, but if you were to look closely at the proteins, you would actually see more cholesterol molecules near those proteins because it helps to stabilize the proteins in the cell membrane. And finally, we use the term selective permeability to um, describe the cell membrane, specifically how it helps to maintain homeostasis inside the cell. Selective means that not everything can go in or out of the cell. Some things have to stay on um, one side or the other. And permeability refers to the ability to cross the membrane. And so we describe the cell membrane as being selectively permeable, meaning that only certain things can cross the cell membrane.